All right, let's go ahead and open in prayer first. God, we thank you for, we thank you for your word and for the histories that you've shown us and for what we can learn from it. And I thank you for the being there for us. And I ask for the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach us what you want us out of this message tonight. In his name we pray, amen. Noah's Ark, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Um, how many of you remember the Statler brothers? They had a song on this, I like that one. But um, I don't know if you've heard, but at the Ark Encounter, there we go. At the Ark Encounter, they're adding a flume log that you can get baptized <laughs> at the Ark. The idea here is because it's an evangelistic opportunity is that they want to get people there and get them to think about Christ and then they want to baptize them. I also understand that if you don't get fully immersed, you get to go around a second time for free. <laughs> now as a Baptist, I have a problem with this because this doesn't give the pastor an opportunity to hold somebody down a little bit longer if they need it. <laughs> Where's Pastor Darren? That was for him. Okay. Um, I have to give credit where credit's due because I'm not original. I steal a lot of, the, I mean, borrow a lot of this stuff from uh, other sources. And uh, Answers in Genesis, of course, is a big source for me. I take a lot of material from them. Also, ICR, or uh, excuse me, is Genesis History, Del Tackett. Um, some of you remember we had a class here where we went through some of Del Tackett's stuff on apologetics, which is really good. But he did Answers in or is, is Genesis History. And um, I like a lot of the resources that they have also. Then, of course, ICR, and they've changed their logo. This is their new logo. They have the double helix as part of their logo. And then, of course, we have Northwest Creation Network. They don't really have a logo, so I just copied part of their page. And then, of course, I've taken from Babylon B. I, I thought that was appropriate. All right. Dale B. Hansen is the Dean of Social Media at Grace to You, which is John MacArthur's ministry. And I like what he says here. Society has no issue being told how to live by society, but will resist it to the last breath being told how to live by God. And I think of that after Pastor Darren's message this morning. And um, he also talked a little bit about something that Martin Luther King had. But um, oh, I had said, Martin Luther King, Maybe we don't agree with everything. And I think there's a lot of pastors, there's a lot of things we don't agree with. We have to discern that. And I think that's on our responsibility to do that. But Martin Luther King did have a lot of things to say that I thought were pretty good. Uh, this is one of them. We must remember that our intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. And I think we have a problem with our education system right now where this isn't being taught. Can we fill the gap or have we allowed that to, to fail in our public institutions? Um, so where's our job there? So I'm a big fan of Awana and Sunday School and, and getting that message out. And uh, may we all partner together to do that, okay? Um, from here, I wanna move, and maybe this isn't an easy segue, and we're not gonna read the whole passage there. Second Peter chapter three, verses one through six. Part I wanna focus on is kind of in the middle of this passage, but behold, <laughs> I now write to your, to, oh, excuse me. But now I write, behold, excuse me, let me back up. I can't read it from here. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the, of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come to you in the last days. And scoffers is what I want to talk about uh, a little bit because scoffers are going to scoff. And one of the reasons I started taking a look at this stuff with Noah is because of the scoffers that are out there. And I'll try to address some of the issues that they have. But the two scoffers credit, it's something that kind of pushes us into doing that too, doesn't it? All right. But continuing on with that, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Here's a verse that might fit with that. Present is a key to the past. Who all knows who Lyle or Charles Lyle is? What? A few, I see a few hands. 
He was a mentor for Charles Darwin. He didn't originate this phrase. His mentor gave it to him, and it may be older than that, because we know that evolution is older than Darwin. He didn't originate it. It was a Greek philosophy that had a lot of evolution as part of its foundation. You know? Darwin just codified it and made it legitimate to, to reject God. It seemed as an intelligent thing to do. So what do we have here? Evolution, they have no observer, so they declare, see if I can get this up here. Whoops, wrong one. There we go. No observer, all things continue, present is the key to the past, and we have no way of knowing. Okay? So we can say whatever we want. Whereas on the other hand, God observed, and he wrote it down in his word, some things are the same, some things are different, written court record in the Bible. We can know for sure, revelation is the key to the past. Past is the key to the present. Okay, the thing I like about the Bible is it's, it's a history of things that have happened and of things that are going to happen. Now you look at the book of Daniel, Daniel wrote it well before some of the things happened. So there's a lot of scoffers who say, it couldn't have been written by Daniel. Even though there's lots of passages that say, I, Daniel, I wrote this. But, oh, he couldn't have known that. Well, God told him because God was there. God knew about it. God plays a lot of parts in the Bible and filling in the holes that the scoffers don't like. Okay. That's Charles Lyle on the left and Charles Darwin on the right. And they fit with the top one. But I like what uh, this guy, Kurt Weiss, says. Dr. Kurt Weiss, is, you may recognize him from his Genesis history, and he has a lot of videos up on Genesis, his Genesis history. But one of the things I like about what he talked about history was the difference in epochs, what he defined as epochs. He says, we have an understanding of the way we live in the past. I mean, it was, excuse me, we have an understanding of the way we live now. We have no understanding of how the people lived during the antediluvian time frame. We can't understand hundreds of years of ages and what their society was like then. We have nothing of that time frame. And right after the flood, we have nothing from that time frame to be able to relate to. Because we're associated with the present. And everything we know about the past, we either find looking in the trash of these societies, or looking at their written record, which are embellished, or looking at God's record which we can trust. How many of you ever had doubts of your faith? Okay, I used to have a lot more. Somebody, a scoffer would come up and I couldn't answer that question. But the more you listen to the scoffers and start taking a look at what they're saying and try to answer that, the less they make sense. Well, at least to me, I have less problem. Am I gonna have a problem with faith in the future? I don't know. But I have a feeling that it's gonna be kinda of hard because, well, for one thing, I'm old. But um, it, it, I have more confidence in God's word. And I think that's one of the advantages of apologetics that Chris is teaching and that we've seen in other places. But apologetics gives us confidence that we can talk with the scoffers. We may not be able to convince a scoffer or somebody who's on the edge with the information we acquire for that. But maybe it gives us the confidence to take a closer look at it. Okay. Um, this was a meme from Patriot, Patriot Post, but I thought it makes a lot of sense. Don't confuse follow the science with follow the scientist. Science is objective and factual. Scientists can be sold to the highest bidder. And that's the humor in that, but scientists not only are sold to the highest bidder, they have their own agendas and their own biases, and they can be swayed by scoffers too. So there's a lot of people who, who have chosen, a lot of scoffers who have chosen evolution because it makes sense and that's what they're taught. But they're not experts in that area. They don't really know. But that's what their experts are telling them. So they can't ignore anything that God says because, well, God can't be real. So once they throw that out, they're okay. They're comfortable without God. It's too bad. Okay. Michael Crichton, um, 
he died in 2008. I like some of his, he was a scientist who started writing books and he wrote Jurassic Park and um, several other science fiction books. Um, he was what they would call today a climate denier. But he had good reason for it too. He wrote a book on that too and I can't remember the title of it and I forgot to look it up. But he said, let's be clear, the work of science has nothing whatsoever to do with consensus. Think of the 97% consensus for climate catastrophe, okay? Consensus is a business, business of politics. Science, on the contrary, requires only one investigator who happens to be right, which means that he or she has results that are verifiable by reference to the real world. In science, consensus is irrelevant. What is relevant is the reproducible results. The greatest scientists in history are great precisely because they broke with the consensus. I like this uh, verse here, Proverbs 25, 2. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings to search things out. I think Pastor Paul taught us um, quite a while back that sometimes going into God's word is like mining. He made the comparison between mining. Sometimes you have to dig for stuff to be able to get that information. You know, there's the easy stuff, the bread that's easy to access or the low stuff on the low shelf the, you know, the, that you make easy to get for, for the little ones. And then there's stuff you put up higher that's a little harder to get to. Um, and that's what God does. But in mining, he does the same thing. I, was, I thought of that when I was going through the series about energy and stuff like that. You know, like rare, rare earth metals. Rare earth metals are not rare. You have to dig for them. But we in our country have decided by law not to mine rare earth metals because it's a dirty process. So we let the Chinese do it. Whoops. Sorry, Marty. Sorry. I threw the microphone. That's not an intended mic drop. Are we better now? Okay. Um, so sometimes you have to dig a little bit more, but what I like about it is that pieces start to come together. You start seeing things. Uh, the more you go through God's word, the more you start seeing stuff come together. Um, I, to me, it's amazing. But you start also looking at stuff that's outside the Bible and you say, okay, I can evaluate and judge this. Where does it fit in here? If it doesn't fit with God's word, it's not worth looking at. Or it needs to be calibrated by that. Okay. Now. Does everybody who look at the Bible agree with everything? No. I'll take a look at uh, disagreements. I've mentioned my brother and my stepbrother, who we're all three in agreement to salvation, that it's eternal, and um, that's the position. We can, so I have no, no problem with working with them on being able to communicate the gospel message to others and sharing the gospel with others with them. My brother believes in the six-day creation, like I do. But his eschatology is a lot different than mine. I can still work with him. Pastor Paul talked about the stair-step process, where he can work with people on different levels. But we have a disagreement. So I need to take a look at that. Is he right or am I right? So I have to exercise that. Both of my, bro my brother and my brother-in-law differ with me on eschatology. I'm a premillennialist. They're not. They're amillennialists. But, okay, if we could ever talk together on that, that might be another issue. But, but you kind of have to take a look at a few things and, and make your assessment. But you yourself are responsible for that. And that's where you can increase your faith. Um, this is Vody Bachman. And I like what he says here, the gospel message is more about sin than about sins. The point is that I don't need to approach a person on the basis of a specific sin that they need to quit, but on the basis of a nature that needs to change. And I like that message, but, and I debated whether I should put this in this talk or not, because it's kind of a segue of where I'm not going to, but I did bring it up anyway, so you're stuck with it. What I want to get back to is what we talked about last time was some of the, the information that's out there or some of the stories from different civilizations and different tribes about the flood. Okay, 
we talked a lot about the North American and South American uh, Indians um, from one book I got through Answers in Genesis, and they're working on another book that'll cover some of the other places, but there are several other books that have tribes from all over the world, okay? But here's a map that somebody put together of what they felt was the consistencies with some of these stories about the flood of what is the most direct or aligned with the, the Bible. And the, the green here is a little like the Bible, and that's dispersed all over the place. Somewhat like the Bible is the blue. Here's the Greeks. Most like the Bible is the Babylonians. Okay. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. What is common with a, a lot of these stories, or not common, if you will, is who God is. There's, most of them are fights with multiple gods, or maybe not even a god. Something happens as to why there's a flood in the first place. And they have a different kind of boat. In fact, one of the Indians that we read about, they didn't use a boat. They had a peace pipe that everybody fit into. I, I still can't picture how that actually works. Okay? But you have, in the different tribes here, you have canoes, rafts, or uh, papaya reed boats. We'll talk about those. Or these little round things. I had a picture of a group of people in Russia on one of these boats, and I thought of including it here because it looked kind of funny, but I didn't. You're stuck with it. But the one, the Babylonian one that I want to talk about was the Gilgamesh one because that's the one that a lot of people say is where the Bible took its story from. Now, the Gilgamesh boat is a big cube. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the Borg cube. Okay. It's a big cube. I think it's 200 cubits by 200 cubits by 200 cubits. Uh, how seaworthy is that? Do we have any boats today that are that shape? I'll talk about that in a minute, but let's talk about this Gilgamesh epic. Who here has read the Gilgamesh epic? Really? Yeah. And Bill, I'm not surprised there. You've read the Gilgamesh epic? I am seriously <laughs> impressed. <laughs> In the original? No, never mind. I'm sorry. That's, that's not fair. Okay. Um, the Gilgamesh epic is supposedly older than the written scriptures in Genesis. So the scoffers say that the Bible stole the information from them or procured it from them, if you will. And that's where they borrowed it. They said, oh, this one's older, so it's more, that's where they got it from. And then your Bible gets it from you know, the book of Genesis. Well, uh, Gilgamesh epic, for those who haven't read it, is a story about a wicked king who fights with and becomes friends with a guy named Enkidu. I don't make these names up. Okay. Enkidu. And then Enkidu gets killed because they, they upset the gods or something after he becomes friends. And so Gilgamesh is a little upset and he wants to look for eternal life. And so he goes to find... Um, Ut not fishtim. Don't ask me if I'm pronouncing it right because I have no idea. But he's kind of like the Noah character, and he's the one who went through the flood on some kind of boat and um, got eternal life because he survived through the. And what happened was that the gods had a fight and they decided to destroy everything, and then they felt guilty about it. And one of them decided to warn Ut not fishtim so that he could save his family. So Gilgamesh goes to see, how can I get eternal life? And he says, oh, stay awake for six days. Oh, okay, I can do that. Well, he falls asleep the first day. Oh, there's another way to do it. So, you know, that's a lot of stuff you have to do to get eternal life. I prefer God's way. The thing I have a problem with here is that, see, I think it's more like we have the original count, the eight people who came off of Noah's Ark, their families, and they propagated, and they heard the stories, and it went down. Somebody went down into Babylon, and they wrote the Gilgamesh epic, and then God preserved the word that came down through Mo to Moses, whether it be written or oral, it's preserved, and he put it in the Bible, independent of the Gilgamesh, so no matter if Gilgamesh is supposedly older or not. And then, of course, to our Bible. However, there's another thing to that. 
The Gilgamesh epic is written in, I think it's 12 tablets. The 11th tablet is in question of whether it was written at the same time as the rest of the epic or added later. I guess they don't have page numbers on these tablets. Okay, but the 11th tablet is the one that talks about the flood. So did it take information from Moses' documents to put in to add it to the Gilgamesh epic? To me, it doesn't matter because of Moses got it from God, however he came by it. But there is a question on that, okay? So before we flood the earth and take a look at all the water that has to go through there, let's talk about the ark <laughs> and Gilgamesh's cube, okay? Take a look at this thing. This is just an example. It's a box. A cube with seven stories in it, and that's supposed to be seaworthy. Not really. Um, there was a Dr. Sion Hong in um, South Korea in, an, uh, in a world-class ship research center called CRISO. I don't know if that's the name of it because it's South Korean or if it's an acronym of some kind or something like that. But they do research on ship hulls. And they took the information from Noah's Ark to see what was the best shape for the Ark. So they went with, you know, maximum stability versus maximum strength and maximum comfort. And the best zone was the design that God gave. How does that fit in there? Okay. So God's shape seemed to be the best for that. All right. But we have another scoffer, so let's talk about him for a minute. This is a comparison with some ships that we are familiar with or know about, Queen Mary, Titanic, and you've seen some of the memes. I think I had one last time about the Titanic compared to Noah's Ark, and we will see that again. But the wooden ships, Santa Maria and the Wyoming, the Wyoming was the largest wooden ship made in modern times. It was a six-mast schooner, okay? And let's see, I did not write down how many um, feet long it was. It wasn't quite as long as what the Ark would be, but, oh, you can see what Bill Nye says there. I guess I did put that on there. People in the early 1900s built an extraordinary large wooden ship, the Wyoming, six-masted schooner, but it would twist in the sea and leak like crazy. The crew could not eventually, or could not, uh, let's say the crew could not keep the ship dry and indeed eventually foundered and sank. They lost all 14 hands. So there were 14 crewmen aboard a ship built by very skilled shipwrights in New England. These guys were the best in the world at wooden shipbuilding and they couldn't build a boat as big as the Ark. Is it possible that the best shipbuilders in the world couldn't do what eight unskilled people Men and their wives able to do? <sighs> well, Mr. Doctor, Professor, wannabe scientist Bill Nye, um, first off, uh, the boat lasted 14 years before it sank, and it hauled coal, coal up and down the coast for 14 years, number one. Number two, and I talked about this last time, is that he's doing the comparison with expert shipbuilders from the present compared to novices in Noah's time. Well, first of all, we don't know that they're novices. What was Noah's trade? The Bible doesn't say. Is there any extant documents that say what his trade was? Nope, nothing survived, okay? So, uh, novices? And even if they started out as novices, they had 50 years to develop skills. How long does it take anybody to get skilled? How long has Bill Nye taken to get his skills? I'm sure it didn't take any 50 years, even if we can call his skills skills. Okay. Um, Bill Nye needs Jesus. So far, he's rejected Jesus every time. But. He needs Jesus, just like we do. 
Okay. Um, next thing I want to go into is gopher wood. What is gopher wood? We don't know. <laughs> the only place it's mentioned in the Bible is Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. And it's God telling Noah to use gopher wood. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia um, lists it as possibly, uh, well, they say possibly mixed with brimstone or pitch. Or there's other parts that talk about being cedar type trees, um, pine because of the resin in it or something like that. Um, and there's also a suspicion here, and he has it down here. A uh, more probable explanation is that which connects gopher with the modern Arabi Arabic kufa, a name given to the boats made of interwoven willow branches and palm leaves with a coating of bitumen outside, used today on the rivers and canals of Mesopotamia. In the Gilgamesh epic, or story of the flood, it specifically mentioned that Noah dabbed his, both, his ark both inside and out with a kind of bitumen. Well, God told him to do that. But International Standard Bible Encyclopedia doesn't think that there was a global flood. So that's kind of where they're coming from. Um, bottom line, we don't know what gopher wood is, so we don't know what kind of wood Noah used. And there's nothing in God's word that said you should preserve all kinds of trees that come across on the ark. So we don't even know if those trees are around anymore. We have no clue. Okay? Um, I showed before, I think it was in the Ice Age when we talked about this, we talked about um, the flood disrupting and breaking up everything and destroying uh, the continents. And I talked about Pangaea, that's where we kind of came from. And I didn't understand the answers in Genesis work on Rodania. But to, to clarify, Pangaea, by the way, is, um, is the Greek for pan, meaning Tyre, and Gaia. You hear, hear that, Gaia or Gaia for Mother Earth. So the whole Earth type continent. And Rodania means motherland. Creationists didn't give them those names. But creationists and naturalists all agree that there's tectonic plaques that separated, but the big disagreement is the time frame that it took. Creationists say that it all took time in one year during the flood. Naturalists say it took millions of years. Creationists have some problems with that. We're not going to go into that tonight, but there is information on that. Uh, if you want to ask me, we can take a look at that. But bottom line is the original continent before the flood was one continent. And wherever Noah built the ark, we have no clue. They have these, you look at these colored spots here, and that's what the geologists are looking at, why they say that there is three continent or continental divisions is the way things broke up. That all these were associated close together because they have cross-contamination of magnetic material and something else. And I'm just, I just found this out very recently, so I'm going, oh, that's amazing. But I don't have enough of it to really show. But that broke up during the, the continents and developed Pangaea as they crashed together. And see these lined, oops, these lined areas in between? That's part of the sediment that's being shuffled up underneath from the oceans to build the larger continents. So when we finally get to the present, we have the original part of the original continent and a lot of sediment that has just been dug up from the top of the land and from the bottom of the ocean. And so we got lots of these huge fossil fields uh, in these areas of sediment. But the geologists, both natural and creationists, feel that um, there was just the smaller continent and it broke up, crashed together. And one of the things they cite for this, let me back up here. I guess it doesn't show it here. But one of the fascinating things, and I should have put a slide in here for this, is where they talk about the Appalachian Mountains 
having a similarity to a string of mountains in um, Finland and Sweden. So they say the continents crashed together in the Atlantic Ocean at some point and then separated again. And so that's where they're looking at geological information for that. So that's fascinating. Okay, now then, yeah. All right. Anybody know what this is? Bill does. This, is, this has been in the news lately because somebody said, oh, we found Noah's Ark. And this is what's left of it. But I think it was like 20 years ago, we had um, David um, Fossild came here to speak to us about this, and he had his book, and that's what he highlighted as being Noah's Ark. And he felt Noah's Ark was a big reed boat covered with bitumen, and he went with that theory. And so it was an interesting book, it was an interesting presentation, um, but there's several geologists that came out here and said, no, this is just some kind of rock outcropping. We can't prove that this is a boat at all. And the dimensions are a little bit off anyway. So um, there's that. I thought it was very interesting, but a couple of things he brought out that uh, we may talk about next time, and I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna be able to do this in three lessons, so I think we're at least four, at least, maybe. By the way, this new tool, it has this vibrator that's supposed to turn on when I've run out of time, but only if I set it. So unfortunately for you, I didn't bother setting it. <laughs> okay, so, um, let's take a look at arcs. Where's the arc mentioned in the Bible? Well, we have three arcs kind of mentioned here. Noah's ark, Moses' ark. <laughs> Wait a minute, people are going, I don't remember Moses being in an ark. Was he? And then there's the ark of the covenant. Okay? Well, here is the interesting thing. The word used for Noah's ark is the same word used for, for Moses' basket. Same word. And it means, well, referring to ark or basket, but it's, in both cases, it depicts something that rescues people in water. Now, the ark of the covenant uses a different word. Aron, which is a box or chest. It is treated as a masculine in some passages and as a feminine as others. But here's what I thought was interesting of it. It's the same word used for, in 2 Kings uh, chapter 12, for a box collecting money. And also it's used in Genesis chapter 50, verse 26, as a sarcophagus that they put Joseph's body in. So that's the box, the Ark of the Covenant or the Iran. So they're not the same word. All right. So the ark. Let's get inside the ark. Well, actually, let's not. Not tonight. I think we will finish here tonight because it is top of the hour. Um, but yeah, so next week, we'll actually get into the building of the ark. I delayed too long in this. Thank you for letting me do that. So let's go ahead and close in prayer. Holy God, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for um, how amazing you are and how much things fit in with your plan. We pray that we might understand your plan better for us and that we might have the confidence to be able to share your message of love to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody.